So if you want to have a conversation, can you please do it elsewhere? Um, my name is Estelle Wilde. The name of this talk is You Don't Need a Framework for That. And the slides are at the bottom right there, uh, estelle.github.com slash uh, JS Framework. So if you want to pull it up, you don't have to. Um, the slides are just interactive in a teeny way, which is if you press the number four on some of the slides, you can take notes and it will be stored in local storage. Um, so you can go back later. It's going to be only on that um, browser, though, because it is stored in local storage. So about me. My name is Estelle Weil, and I am um, an author, speaker, consultant on a CSS, HTML5, and JavaScript, and uh, basically just a UI engineer. Um, being a consultant, all my views, all views said today are those of my employer and not necessarily mine. Um, so what we're going to do today is talk about frameworks and when to use them and when not to use them. So I wanted to show you, this was, this was my first framework. Uh, this is a table design that I did for Kodak Gallery uh, when it was still called Ophoto back in 2002. And it still works today. And the framework I used looked like this. It said document, if document get element by ID. If not, if document all. Does anyone remember that? Or am I? Yeah. Um, so I'm not the oldest one in the room. Um, the main reason that we did that was to normalize across browsers. Now the main reason we use frameworks is still to normalize browser features. Or that should be the main reason why intro level people are doing this. So we have add event listener. And that is the WC3 standard. Before that, or not even before that, but just in IE and Opera, we had the non-standard attach event. And before that, we had the on-click. But note that add event listener has been supported in IE since IE9 and since Opera 7, which means that 99.98% of mobile devices understand this. So if you're importing a JavaScript framework just for your event handling, you don't need to do that anymore. So I'm not saying frameworks are bad. There's lots and lots of wonderful frameworks. Here are some. Uh, this was, slide was put up like two months ago, so there's probably like 112 new ones. Um, this is some mobile frameworks. Feel free to use them if you need them. This is my favorite, um, HTML9 responsible, <coughs> responsive boilerplate JavaScript. Um, the output is this. The main problem with this framework is the person misunderstood the web. It's supposed to be a kitten and not a dog. Um, so frameworks, in general, they are good. Um, so why do you want to use a framework? You want to use a framework because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. If you are doing a, a web application and you need 4,000 lines of JavaScript and you're creating, you know, Google Mail, Gmail, use a framework. That makes sense. Um, all of those frameworks I mentioned on the previous pages, they're written by a lot of people. And I'd say, you know, one other brain is better than my brain, but you have a lot of people working on these. So sometimes my slides work. When you're using a framework, you can be pretty, like if you're using jQuery, you can be pretty confident that the people who have developed these, you know, YUI, jQuery, everything else, have, um, have really worked at optimizing the code. Um, it makes, when you're including a library, your code might be more readable since you're just doing dollar sign and everyone now knows. A lot of people don't actually know the difference between jQuery and regular JavaScript. Um, one thing about frameworks is it gives you function chaining. And that is, the, we don't have that natively, um, or, well, rather we don't have iterations natively in JavaScript. So, so that's a big bonus. But if you're only going to do one thing, don't import a library for that. Um, if you're using a framework, it'll be less code for you since you're importing all the functionality. Um, and there's a really fast learning cu curve. The biggest problem is, you know, the benefit is you don't need to know JavaScript. The biggest problem is you don't need to jo know JavaScript. There's tons of people, I see resumes, they say they're, they're JavaScript ninjas, and they don't know the difference between jQuery and JavaScript. They don't realize that dollar sign is not a native function. It is now in the console, um, but it doesn't mean exactly what jQuery does. So when I see this 
um, on, in the code of a resume, you know, like when, I, when I'm viewing the portfolio and I see this, if someone imported a jQuery library just to add class first, I want to smack them upside the head. But I definitely, I don't want to hire them. So to show you an example of when you should use a framework and, or when you should not use a framework, this example is a jfiddle. It, it adds the little icons here. You'll notice it has a few lines of code and it inc includes jQuery 1.7.2, right? I did the exact same thing in one extra line of code without importing a library. You'll see right here, no library was included. Let's show you the code. Three lines versus five lines. But jQuery is really fast, especially if you get it from Google APIs on a CDN. But it's not the best idea. And if you do it for five lines like that and you include a library because you need five lines of code, I want to smack you upside the head and I don't want to hire you. Um, so why? You're including 92 kilobytes. You're doing an extra HTTP request. You're doing an extra DNS lookup. And you're adding four joules of energy to parse that JavaScript. Who here has their phone plugged in right now and is charging their phone? Not a single person. That's the reason why. So we definitely don't want to be including frameworks or doing the extra HTTP request or doing the extra DNS lookup or adding stuff to our memory when we are on a mobile device that has 256 megabytes of RAM. Um, DNS problem. This is what the mobile phone goes through when it does a DNS lookup. You have a mobile browser and you're saying, hey, I want to go to google.com. Um, it first tells the cell tower, I want to go to google.com. It doesn't know the IP address. The cell tower then contacts the phone company, which then goes to the DNS server, which then brings it all the way back. So you're doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 steps to get a DNS, to get this, this site. Um, this is where the latency occurs. So it actually is an issue. But another issue that no one's really thought about is who killed my battery? Uh, this was a study done. It's definitely a, a, a too long didn't read. But um, if you want me to summarize it for you, it basically says, when you use jQuery like Wikipedia does, they include jQuery for their mobile site. Anyone think jQuery, I mean, Wikipedia is that dynamic? Like, does it need a library? No. They actually included um, jQuery to do a get element by ID. Um, but every time you go from one page to the next, you're, you're using four joules of energy because, it, yes, it might be cached the second page you see, but it still has to parse it and execute it. So I'm not going to talk about mobile performance that much, but if you're interested in mobile performance, uh, there's a link right here to a presentation I did on mobile performance which goes um, um, deeper into this. But another time that, the re another reason that you don't want to be including, or another time you don't want to be including frameworks and a reason why you really want to learn JavaScript is if you're creating something that is going to be in someone else's site. If you're creating a third party widget, you don't want to be responsible for being that single point of failure on that person's website. You also don't want to be hijacking their global variables. Um, and here is a list of things you don't want to do. Um, if you're going to include a third party uh, widget, if you're going to create a, th a widget that's going to be on someone else's site, you're allowed one global variable. Make that super unique. And actually, I, I recommend uh, appending like a date or something like that, a random variable that you know they're not going to use so that you never conflict. And also, don't ever hijack their event listeners. You shouldn't be having a, um, event listeners on all of your links. Instead, make your whole um, widget uh, listening. Um, and you definitely don't want to block downloading, rendering, or the window onload. So never, just basically as a general rule, never add frameworks in third-party widgets you create because they might be including your widget three times. They might be including jQuery themselves. And so you're including jQuery three times, you know, parsing it three times plus their time, so that's uh, 16 joules of energy if they're on a mobile device every time they load their page. So this is my favorite library. I was kidding when I said it was HTML9 boilerplate. Um, Vanilla.js. There actually is a site called vanilla-js.com. Um, 
So when you are creating a website, when you have a site online, anyone here ever go to a news page and like it stops right about here and it doesn't load for like four and a half minutes and then you hit the back button? Um, when you load JavaScript, you already know this. You're, when, you have a, when you have the script file, uh, the browser stops downloading everything else. It stops making additional requests. And it waits till it downloads, parses, and executes your JavaScript. So when you are loading the page, if you have a JavaScript up here, um, and if a framework, you know, you're downloading four megs of framework, um, it's just hanging. A lot of sites don't need, uh, you know, if you're doing a web application, even if you're doing a web application, Twitter is a great example. Remember when Twitter used to fail all the time? Because the first 20 responses were dynamically generated. Now, when Twitter serves up their site, they serve the 20 first responses as static HTML. That way the user has something to see while all the JavaScript um, gets loaded up later. So that's the general idea. If possible, make the page load before, you know, with content before the JavaScript loads. Let's see what else we have to say here. Um, yeah, I already said that. Basically, when you're loading a page, the first 12 seconds until your JavaScript is fully loaded, it's as if your, your user had JavaScript turned off, right? Um, and another reason to, to do this correctly is you're, you'll, you'll maintain your own skills set. If you're always relying on frameworks, you're never going to maintain your skills set. So back again to the smackable code. Um, this one says, find the first element and add class first. And they've imported jQuery to do that. We're going to learn some code now. So I'm going to declare my variables here, just so no one says I didn't declare my variables ahead of time. And if I missed one, forget it, like, whatever. In vanilla JS, I can use document query selector li class list add first. This just finds the first one, because it's query selector. or I could simply have in CSS done li first of type. This is the simplest way to do it, right? Um, this is the way to do it for IE8 and earlier. So I'm going to show you when JavaScript's not necessary. Tables, stripey tables. Who here has created a zebra table? OK, so half of you are lying. Um, everyone probably has striped a table. Um, by, and what we've been doing is adding odd and even. And we've been using libraries to do this, and there's no reason to. We can do it in CSS. This says tr nth of type odd, make it white, nth of type even, make it gray. Not supported in IE8, so you simply just var tr, get elements by tag name tr, loop through them, every other one, add a class. Now, the thing with this is, and if you do it with JS, anyhow, every time someone sorts, you need to redo this, right? With CSS, when someone sorts, you don't have to call that function. This will always read it. When you do it with JavaScript, you're, you're basically changing the DOM, adding the classes, and you have to redo it. So you have to redo it whether you're using a library or not. So just do it with CSS if you can. If you can't, call this function on every, on every, you know, if you need to support non-mobile devices um, or old IE, um, use that way. Another thing that people use uh, frameworks for is a drop-down menu. This is pure CSS. It opens slowly, very pretty, right? This is the lines of code. I'm scaling from zero, 100% width, 0% height, to 100% height and 100% width over 200 milliseconds or 0.2 seconds. I have a 50 millisecond delay because there's, you, know, you don't want someone to accidentally open it when they, when they fly through it like that. Um, and then just do, doing a change on hover. Very, very simple. Um, not, not fully simple because we still have um, prefixing, but definitely better than including a, a library. And does it work in IE8, IE7, and IE6? For i7 and i6, you just, you make it open, you make it appear and disappear with hover. Display block, display none. 
Um, you just don't get the nice little transition. Do people in, on IE6 care about your transition? No. They see crappy websites all day long. Um, they're used to it. Why can't I move forward? Oh, if you can't move forward on the slides, you just have to click outside of the slides. So CSS is awesome, um, but so is JavaScript. So one thing that people missed was that there's actually na native get elements by class name. So get elements by class name has been supported since IE9, um, and it's pretty cool, like when you do a query, get element by class name with a dollar sign and putting a class name, you actually get returned a live node list. Um, by live node list, I mean, I mean if you add something with that same style, it gets added to that list. Um, so here we have element, document get element by ID bar. So we, we're just finding, it says if we did a, a, oops, this code does not equal that code. This should say foo. Um, so you do a document get element by ID, and then within that element get element by class name foo, and you found all the elements with class foo inside of bar. Um, so this should have been, and I don't think this is editable here. Oh, it is, okay. That would have been the same. Okay. So, as I said, live node list. So here, originally in this deck, I have 53 slides. Then I add a slide with the class foo, and every time I add one, I'm not doing another um, slides. The slides was done up here. I'm only doing a console log of how many there are. It's updated. That's a live node list. Um, note that it's case sensitive. Um, get elements by class name is case sensitive except for in quirks mode. Um, so just assume it's case sensitive. Problem with get elements by class name is when you do a request for get elements by class name, it is going to return, if it, if it doesn't find a node, it's going to return an empty node list, which will return true. So you need to find length because here I say, I, um, as an example, not found, I do test me, it actually alerts because an empty node list is not falsy, it's truthy. You guys understand that? Yeah, okay. So later on, if you want to read, this is actually the spec. Um, I put it in here for people who aren't listening to me. Um, and going back later on. So we already showed the, you this, which is the selectors API. We, we did a, a query selector earlier for the LI, but let me um, go over it. This is supported since IE8. Um, what you can do is do either a document query selector or a query selector all. You can do it on a document or on an element. Um, and what it does is it, you can put any CSS selector here. And as you saw earlier, we had TR nth of type odd, right? So selectors can get very complex. So learn your selectors. You shouldn't be just learning JavaScript, you should be learning um, selectors. And I have a, a talk on selectors also if you want, if you go to my GitHub, it's, it's all, all the talks are listed there. Um, so learn your selectors, but use the document query selector all. It'll return all of the elements uh, with the class name foo inside ID bar. Uh, problem with query selector all though, which is different, or not problem, it depends, it's, it could be a positive or a negative. It's, um, it is a static node list, which means if I update the page, it doesn't know that there's more um, slides. So you access it with query selector all, we already did this, and you can actually, I already said this, you can do complex selectors with comma. Um, query selector will return just the first one, query selector all will return all of them. And if you are interested in here are the selectors APIs, and I'll add the link to my, um, uh, my selectors presentation um, later on. Um, so static node list. Remember we created a few extra slides, so we were at 55 slides. So here I'm going to add another slide, and then I'm going to do, this stands for element, um, get elements by class name, and this stands for query selector all. So as I add a slide, we're at 56, 55, 57, 55, 58, 55. So notice that query selector all is remaining static. It is, um, which means when you're actually doing, um, when you're using these two features, um, elements by class name will be faster up front, and query selector all will be faster later on, because query selector all is no longer querying the DOM. It's already queried the DOM, it's, it's storing it. 
So um, in terms of speed, uh, those are considerations. One of the reasons people use frameworks is because there's no native iteration on these things. But how hard is this to do? Seriously. Um, so you don't need to, if you're doing something as simple as adding class current, and that's actually how this slide deck works. This is HTML5, the only, or CSS3, the only JavaScript that makes these slides work is when I click on an arrow or some other keys. I mean, you know, the local storage is something different. But the only thing that makes it actually render across is I take the current slide, I make it change the class to previous, and the slide that had this class next, I make it slide current, and the one after that, I make it slide next. That's all there is to it. I'm actually just changing class names, and that's how this whole slide deck works. Um, no library needed, it's under 200, I mean, it's, I added features to it, but in all, it would have been under 40 lines of code to make this slide deck work. No framework needed. Um, so another feature we, that we're given with, um, with uh, JavaScript is class list. People are including libraries to toggle classes. We now have element by class name, so you can create the function yourself, but we also have class list. You, this is the, Java, uh, the jQuery equivalent of add class, remove class, toggle class, and has class. We have classlist.add, classlist.remove, classlist.toggle, and classlist.contains. If you're doing mobile, don't include a library just because you want to change a class. Um, again, no native iterations. So I'm not going to cover data set, but I left this in the slide deck. This is another feature, which is just basically you can create your own attributes. Um, and basically, data set, well, let's just cover it anyways. I'm so going to go over time, but they were late by two minutes, so I'll be late by two minutes. So here, this is what I used to work at this company, and this is what our code looked like. We basically um, hacked all the, um, we added all sorts of, uh, of attributes that were irrelevant, like EVT5 does not exist. Omnit does not exist. And rel, this is not a relationship. Um, because we wanted spans to, we convert spans to links on the fly um, because we didn't want to lose link juice. This is bad code. And I am responsible for it, but it's actually my PM's fault because they told me to do it and they told me I had to. I mean, that's why I no longer work there and why the company no longer exists. But we won't go there. Um, so basically in HTML5, you can define your own attribute. And so you just put the data dash in front of it and you create whatever you want. So foobar equals test. Um, the cool thing is there's an API for that, the data set API. So um, while this isn't supported in i7 or i8, you know, get attribute and set attribute is, and you can create whatever you want. So um, totally use the data set attributes. But let's not cover the data set attributes. If you're interested, you can go back and look at the slides. Um, so just to summarize, when it comes to mobile, most of your mobile um, users, actually probably all of your mobile users, if they're accessing your application, your web application via their phone, they have a smartphone. They have a phone with a kick-ass browser. You don't need to do the ad event listener. Uh, you know, you don't need to include a framework just for understanding selectors. They understand all the selectors. You don't need to add a framework just for um, normalizing ad event listener. They understand that. Um, it's feature detection that's the issue, not code parity. So yeah, you can include modernizer. But don't include the whole, mo I mean, modernizer, everyone know what modernizer is? Yeah. Um, just include that one feature, and Modernizer allows you to do that, and you can port it um, into your code. Um, always remember with mobile that there's memory latency and CPU concerns, um, and the battery drainage issue. Um, so I'm not saying don't include frameworks, I'm just saying if you're doing a static web page and you only needed to open up, you know, or, or stripe a table, or just do an animation, if you're just doing an animation, use CSS animations, don't use a framework. Um, and in general, if you can do it in a few lines of code, don't import a library. Um, make your homepage work without using JavaScript first. Learn from Twitter's mistake. Realize that if I get to your site and I have to wait eight seconds for it to load, I'm hitting the back button. And so are, you know, 
so are most of your users. Um, never import a, um, a framework or a library if you're doing third-party widget. Um, and I'll actually link to something on that because I was deep diving into third-party widgets and was going to add a lot of stuff about that and then realized it was 30 minutes, so I couldn't. Um, and mostly use tools, libraries as a tool. Don't rely on it as a crutch um, because you'll realize that if you're using jQuery as a crutch, you will no longer know how to code JavaScript. Um, and always remember mobile. So that is um, it for me, and I'm only two minutes over, which is good. Um, so I will be here most likely in the afternoon if um, I'm fighting a, a, a red light violation this afternoon, so wish me luck. Um, and if I get done with the courthouse soon enough, I'll be popping back, but if traffic's too bad, I won't. So if you have questions, um, I'll be here during the break, but also you can um, uh, do the 4D question thing, and then there'll be a panel where we answer them later on. So thank you very much. <laughs>